Nexus PMG welcomes you to the Bigger Than Us podcast, which we as energy geeks lovingly refer to as the BTU. Bigger Than Us is a podcast that focuses on ideas that will shape the future of our planet and ultimately our existence. We will occasionally lean into energy topics because after all, it's the key to our collective survival, but we'll also explore other ideas and topics that we believe will have an impact that is bigger than us. And now, on to today's show. Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Mike Zelkind to the show. Mike Zelkind, co-founder and CEO of 80 Acres Farms, knew that food wasn't what it used to be. He wanted to make it better by creating a new kind of farm, one capable of producing an abundance of crop varieties year-round, grown completely indoors. A farm that can produce 100 times more food than an ordinary farm, using 100% renewable energy, without any pesticides or excessive food miles. In 2015, 80 Acres Farms was born. Over Mike's 30-year career, he held senior executive roles within leading domestic and international companies, including Fortune 50 Food and Beverage, retail and consumer packaged good companies, as well as major consulting and private equity firms. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Raj. Mike, where in the world are you? I am in a town called Hamilton, Ohio, about 20 miles north of Cincinnati, Ohio. And how's the weather up there today? It's beautiful. I'm actually looking up at the sky right now, and I see few clouds, but uh, a gorgeous Hamilton view, a lot of uh, beautiful architecture and nice weather, about uh, 55 degrees, nice and crisp, but clear and beautiful. Sounds lovely. And how are you holding up during this pandemic? Well, um, as, as, as well as can be, we're, we're actually doing well. Family is, uh, is doing well. Our, our associates are doing well. And our business is actually um, quite resilient and exposing some, some issues with today's uh, vulnerable supply chain. So the business is actually uh, thriving through this pandemic. And as, as much as we were prepared to change the way the world eats before COVID, we're um, uh, more ready to, to really take on these massive issues um, after the disease. Well, good to hear that. So Mike, I like to open my show by asking my guests the following question. If you were asked to share something interesting about yourself, what would it be? Hmm. <laughs> um, a little obnoxious for me to pick things that I find interesting about myself. Huh? Um, I guess um, I'll pick... Um, the fact that I was uh, a chess master very early in my life, started out playing chess. My dad is a phenomenal um, chess coach. I grew up in Russia, so it was um, uh, par for the course in Russia. Everybody was a chess player, and I happened to grow up in a chess family and uh, played professionally when I was young. Uh, started college early, and when I finished college, I actually went to Europe to to attempt with a couple of best buddies to play chess for a living. So I had a fun beginning to my career, which led to a lot of interesting uh, strategic opportunities later on in life. That is really interesting. Have you watched um, the movie called Queen of Katwe? No, I haven't. I thought you were going to ask me about searching for Bobby Fischer. That's the most common movie I'm asked about. So Queen of Katwe is a movie about a young girl in Uganda who becomes a chess master. I am writing it down and I will watch it this weekend. My kids can't get enough. They keep watching it over and over again. Huh. Looking forward to it. So Mike, you know, you mentioned something about food supply earlier and I would like for you to share a little bit about your current endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. We're um, an indoor farming company. Our goal is truly to change the way the world eats. We want to bring clean, fresh, nutritious produce to the communities all over the world. We want to grow that food, that produce in the communities, and we want to grow it with the local folks 
in those communities for those communities. Um, we have this notion that what we do is better for you, better for your community and better for the world in a sense, um, better for you because you're eating healthier, cleaner, tastier produce and you can get away from all the chemicals and all the junk food. We resort to junk food because we can't get the, the satisfaction or the availability of um, phenomenal tasting products or tomatoes. If I can make tomatoes that taste like Skittles and get kids to snack on our cherry tomatoes, which have a wonderful balance between sweetness, uh, natural sugar content with acidity, the right type of uh, skin and uh, the juiciness and the meatiness of a tomato. If we can create that perfect tomato that people just want to pop and eat, it's much better for you. It's better for your community because we create jobs. We bring labor uh, local. Uh, we hire local labor and we create those jobs in the community. We spend money in the community and we reintroduce folks back to the food. Um, and it's better for the world because we grow so much more sustainably than any other form of agriculture. Uh, we use 97% less water. All the statistics that you've been hearing about indoor farms, um, you know, it's, it's all pretty similar. The point is we grow in a completely controlled environment. So we don't have to, um, um, the, the water gets recaptured and, and cleaned and reused. We use, we use clean air. We use good nutrients for our produce, and we're not just dumping them into waste streams and no fish kill resulting of, um, of over-application of fertilizer or anything else in our process. So it's just a really clean, sustainable, natural way of growing. That's the thing that shocks a lot of people. It's actually a more natural way of growing than a lot of other traditional agricultural methods. And it gives the shelf life and the freshness back to the consumer. So we build these indoor farms by distribution centers of our customers, retail customers, food service customers. And we shorten this massive supply chain. On average, food travels over 2,000 miles to get from farm uh, through many, many steps to our tables in U.S., 4.6 thousand miles globally on average. We shorten that to just the last mile. And um, folks that eat our food are eating food that has been picked at the peak of ripeness. It's usually one or two days old. It's full of nutrition, tastes great, and it's completely clean, so it's good for you. So that's the intention. The intention is to re-engage communities, reconnect people back to their food supply, and produce this affordable, healthy, clean produce um, everywhere in the world. So what's the footprint, or how large is one of your farms? We, we have what we call a, a reference design. Um, it's on average let's just say 70,000 square feet, which is a little less than two acres. And um, we, again, the goal is to put it next to the distribution center of our customers and that two acre farm can produce equivalent of well over a hundred acres, uh, depending obviously on the product mix, but it can be well over a hundred acres, could be 200 acres, could be 300 acres of conventional type produce. And the numbers, again, this is not voodoo magic or this is all really simple, basic math. USDA publishes um, how many tons of lettuce, for example, if we pick lettuce or leafy greens, a variety of leafy greens are produced on average on an acre of land in US or other parts of the world. And we can measure how many tons of produce we produce on the same footprint. And that's how we get the, the multiples, if you will. And the, the reason is that we grow products, we optimize photosynthesis, we do essentially the, uh, our, our growing process, the opposite of, um, of uh, GMO here, genetically modified organisms, right? Instead of modifying genetics of something um, so that those plants or products can survive in certain environments, deal with certain pests or microclimates or whatever else, we use the original genetics of the plant, we create this perfect controlled environment around those original genetics and we optimize them so the plant can thrive and grow faster and healthier. Of course, we have to stress the plant to, uh, by stressing the plant, the plant responds by uh, producing these secondary metabolites or phytochemicals, which is really 
when you start thinking about food as medicine, we spell pharmacy with an F. Um, that's how we produce a lot of these healthy elements naturally, stress the plants to have them produce these secondary metabolites, which act as medicine. And when we eat them, obviously in right proportions, it's good for us and our bodies. Yeah. So, so the footprint of a farm is again, about a little less than two acres producing significant qualities, but because we grow so much faster, as I said earlier, um, we go through more cycles and we can stack our crops. We can vertically layer our fields in a sense, get proper airflow through them, get proper lighting, proper dehumidification, and by layering our crops and by growing them faster, we can we can grow a lot more in the same footprint. So just as an example, uh, an average farmer might have two harvests of lettuce a year, sometimes three. Spinach in Texas, you might sometimes on a superb year have three harvests of spinach off and you'll have one to two. Um, we can have 17 to 20 harvests of spinach um, a year because we can grow it so much faster in optimal conditions. The same quality, the same dry matter, better quality, actually, better spinach, better product. And then we can layer 8, 10, 15, 20 levels in separate modules in this controlled environment. So if you multiply um, you know, 10, you know, 10x number of cycles a year that you get times the levels that you have uh, for the same footprint. If we have, let's say, a 10 level farm and we grow 10 cycles, we'll grow on the same footprint 100 times more than a traditional farm will grow on their footprint or a greenhouse for that matter. So are your current facilities single story or double story? So actually, we have a variety of facilities. When we started with this business, we started by uh, testing our business model in small farms. We were building small 10,000 square foot farms. Some were container based, some were other modules. But the intention was we had some farms that tested water systems, other farms tested lights, other farms tested irrigation, what we call fertigation, kind of fertilizer and irrigation at the same time, so nutrient system with water and systems together. Other farms tested all this data collection and AI and machine learning and all this ability to really process all this key information so we could learn faster and optimize our recipes and nutrients and all these other things. So we started with a bunch of farms, some for products like tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers were single layer, what are called high wire systems, and others for leafy greens and culinary herbs were stacked systems. So they'd be 10, 15 levels, um, depending. We could stack grow zones on top of each other and get multiple levels. Um, we're going to a system that can grow a lot of these crops, most of these crops in the same system, and it will be a stacked multi-level system. But we started with a variety of crops. We started with field agriculture. We started with greenhouses. I've been in the food industry for 30 years. So we, we started testing a lot of these things many years ago to really compare how crops go, what's nutritional value, what's the speed of growth, what's the taste, what are the yields, how do you produce the highest quality produce with the right yield so that you can afford that capital investment up front because it is more expensive to build these indoor farms initially. It's getting cheaper and cheaper. But we have to prove the business model to ourselves uh, when we started. So we have multiple levels farms. We have standardized in this reference design, which, again, has many levels. The farm we're building in Ohio here will have 10 levels. So you mentioned quite a few technologies. You mentioned AI, and I've had the benefit of watching some of the videos, which I'll share in the show notes. But can you share how long it took you to perfect some of those technologies? I've seen some robots involved and then obviously this, the water systems and AI. Yeah, perfect is a strong word. I don't think we've perfected them yet, but we've been working a lot with them and we're getting better and better every month. You know, if you think about the fact that we can grow in this, just picture a used shipping container. A used shipping container is not an optimal growing in um, size necessarily for commercial production, but for the uh, example here to use it as an example or for R and D picture the fact that crops can grow. We can control every aspect. We can control the grow medium. So instead of using polluted soils that we have from years of pesticides and herbicides being dumped on them, 
we can use peat moss or other soil replacements. We still create a healthy microbiome in those soils, and we can talk a lot more about that later if interesting uh, to folks. But um, you control all of that, but you can control the root zone temperature. You can control the speed and the airflow, so you can get more wind or less wind. You can control the lighting in the spectrum, and you might say, well, what do you mean you control the lighting? Well, we can almost control the seasons. You can create you know, a, a winter season. How does the plant know that winter is coming? Uh, a tomato plant, for example, when it needs to fruit. Um, well, very simply, in the winter, the temperature drop between night and day is faster. The, the plants see slightly different frequency of lights, and, um, and the plants get less light, what's called a day-light interval. So plants get less light, obviously, in winter month, uh, shorter days, um, than in the summer. We can model that plants have been adapting for many, many years um, to these different environmental conditions. By understanding these environmental conditions, we can recreate them and we can drive the plant in any way we need. So because we can control every aspect of the growth cycle and optimize that recipe and grow so much faster, we can then capture that data. Um, we have vision systems, we have cameras, we have a variety of sensors, and we have a lot of other um, ways to capture um, uh, qualitative data. We bring it into this 80 acres platform that we have designed. We have image libraries of these plants through vision system. We have databases. It all goes through essentially data processing after collection from all our farms. And then it pops into your algorithms, right? Your mathematical algorithms, which mm -hmm. can be, one can be optimizing nutrition. The other can be optimizing organoleptics. The third can be optimizing yields. The fourth can be optimizing something else. And as you're getting more and more data and you um, optimize or attempt to optimize this, uh, um, this, let's just say, yield or nutrition, you can feed that recipe back into the system and grow the next set of crops with those next conditions. Again, capturing all the images and all the pictures and everything else. The point is we've developed a lot of technologies along the way from how do you capture the data? How do you process it? How do you synthesize it? How do you model it? What information you need? So it took a while, a lot of trial and error of, you know, what, what do you capture? What do you do with it? How do you assess it? So it's, it's an evolutionary process and we're far from, um, from, um, perfect or, you know, we're, we're continuing to learn, we're continuing to evolve. That's on the tech side. On the robotics side, um, different approach. We started purposely with completely manual farms where my business partner and I and our early team, we were all our early farmers. We have different backgrounds, engineering, horticulture, marketing, uh, technology, whatever. And we all were growing in a variety of different systems. We were initially system agnostic. We didn't know which systems would work best. So we bought a bunch of systems and tried a bunch of systems and duplicated it. And we wanted to do everything manually because we wanted to figure out what's worth automating. When we started this company, we started with our own money, our own retirement funds. We didn't feel it was ethical to take other people's money, frankly, until we proved the business concept, um, which to us meant grow the crops, go through many cycles, do it effectively, push it out into retail and food service channels, make sure the customers come back and they want the product. There was a lot of cycles in there as we were optimizing our crops, the taste, the texture, the flavor profiles, working with a lot of local chefs. And then only then make sure that there is a financial model here. There's a pro forma that makes sense so that we would want to invest our own money into it. We didn't have other investors we had to convince or rationalized to. We were our own investors, so we were our worst critics. The product had to taste great. It had to be built right. It had to work, and there had to be a business model before we expanded. And only when we went through all that many years later did we actually take first professional money, if you will, institutional money, um, to help us scale the business and grow. But the point is that we started with a completely manual farms to assess which parts do we need to automate. There's a lot of back-breaking labor and back-breaking work in farming. And if you look at the big problems that a lot of our farmers have today, it's the fact it's, it's labor availability. And it's the fact that our farmers are aging out. 
I don't know what the average age of farmers, but it's been between 56 and 59 years old. And it's harder and harder to attract young folks with different skill sets to farming and to really rejuvenate the whole industry. And that's what we're doing. You look at our average farmer, our average farmer is 25 to 26 years old. And they have more experience, by the way. If you look at how many cycles of crops they've grown, I'll put any one of my farmers, my 25, 26 year old farmers, against most 50, 60 year old farmers who've had the same experience, you know, time and time again. They're very hardworking people, they're doing the best they can. But it's very, very hard. We just go through so many cycles so fast that our guys can learn so fast. And it's attracting this whole new young farmer that uses technology and really wants to understand what makes the crops tick. So as we started doing this, we started automating things that the greenhouse industry has automated a lot of it. Uh, Seeding, for example, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Seeding has been automated by greenhouse industry. So we took it and we adapted it. Uh, Transplanting has been automated by greenhouse industry and outdoor industries. So we took that and adapted it. Harvesting to a certain degree, we have to modify to our needs. And we can explain why later. Um, you know, moving trays and automating with robotics, a lot of that kind of backbreaking work that you couldn't get labor um, to really support because it's really hard, thankless work. That's what we really spent time automating. So instead of having seeders and pickers, we have machine operators, we have quality technicians, we have crop scientists. So we've upgraded our jobs to a much higher level. We pay a great wage to folks and you know, they love working here and they feel very satisfied at the end of the day and they're growing a lot. We're all continuing to learn, but yeah, that, that's what led to that side of automation. There's a lot of different components to technology here, but I think with automation and uh, AI I, or machine learning, I should say, um, those were the two main ones that I wanted to hit. So it sounds like You know, you said you invested a lot of your own money, your time, physical labor while you were actually farming. The crux of our conversation is the why behind what you do. You've obviously got passion for this, but why this? Why indoor farming? What keeps you motivated? What keeps you moving forward? Wow. Yeah, that's also a deep question. I'll try to keep it somewhat short. Um, So I'm an immigrant to this great country. I grew up in Russia came out as a little kid, uh, 11, we left about 12 when I got here. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, I have fond memories of food and, and farming. My grandpa was a bit of a, um, homemade agronomist, if you will, or self-taught, I should say agronomist. He had a, we had a little dacha. It sounds, uh, exotic when you read, uh, Pushkin or, or, others and you're um, you're reading about dachas it seems like these magnificent affairs but in reality it was a little shed outside of the city where uh, the air was a little easier to breathe and it was one room and there was a little plot of land outside and my grandpa used to plant tomatoes and strawberries and other things and had some chickens and we as the kids would run around and play with it and um, so, so I have a lot of really fond family memories around growing produce and just kind of as things you do without really understanding it. And I have a lot of memories about what those tomatoes and strawberries tasted like. Um, Not the tomatoes and strawberries that we unfortunately today, we came to this country, um, again, as pretty poor immigrants. Um, We had a difficult time with um, a lot of uh, affordability of some foods. So this concept of uh, democratization of our food systems, but high quality food has, I guess, been in me from the beginning. Um, We would go with my dad and, for example, to farmer's markets and, um, um, you know, we uh, timed it to, we made a science out of it where you get there in the last 15 to 20 minutes of the farmer's market and no good farmer wants to take produce with them sell it or smell it mentality kicks in. So they'll essentially give it away to just, you know, get it off their truck. So we would buy boxes of tomatoes for, you know, a couple of dollars and we would eat the whole week on whatever kind of the leftover produce in farmer's markets was, which was, by the way, phenomenal produce usually. But I grew up with that as well. So I've always had a deep food connection. I've always been a foodie. 
Um, I think the concept, uh, the immigrant mentality and the desire to feed the world has always been there, but it's, it's difficult. It requires technology and time and um, capability and a team. It requires a whole village. It's not something that one person or one company can ever do by itself. So um, I got somewhat randomly into the food network, if you will, my first job out of school. I was an electrical engineer with math and computer science um, minors, and I got to work for General Mills and started building plants and running plants. And looking back on it now, 30 years later, I've been in the food industry for 30 years. It's all I've done. It's all I know. I've run food companies and um, have been around food and farming my whole life. And I think, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so, I started realizing how broken our food systems were. And I honestly felt that it was guys like me that were responsible for not fixing them. These supply chains, this concept that the customer is always right and the customer is always right. But the concept that, you know, you have to have everything 24-7, 365 days a year, wherever you are, wherever you live, um, is problematic. The fact that, you know, we wanted things that didn't grow in season and you have to have it delivered um, created these messy complicated, expensive, broken, vulnerable supply chains where, you know, we'll grow strawberries, you know, in Mexico, repack them in California and ship them all over, you know, God's green earth, all over U.S., wherever. And the intention is not that anybody's doing anything wrong and I have no problems with Mexico and I have no problems with California or anything else. I do have a problem with taking um, produce that is intended to have five or six day shelf life and making it last two or three weeks because to do that, you have to breed it for transportation logistics, not nutrition and flavor. You have to um, you have to pick it before it's ripe. You have to do so many things to that produce to make it survive. And at the end of the day, you're not getting nutritional value. You've cut that produce off before it's ripe. You know, you're you're relying on the US food industry is relying on products looking good, those Florida grown tomatoes that have to look perfect. Doesn't matter what they taste like. But God forbid they don't look perfect. No retailer carry them. They'll reject the trucks. Well, those aren't the best tomatoes. We're eating teddy bear stuffing instead of eating good nutritional tomatoes or strawberries or other things. So I've been wanting to fix it for a while. So after being in the food industry and running companies, my business partner and I with our team, we had a core team with us, decided to leave the food industry and and do it right, not just complain about how tasteless the food is. Everybody always talks about they go to Europe and food tastes great. They go to Japan, they eat a real strawberry or they have great tomatoes in Holland. But you're sitting here in America and you can't get quality produce. It's, it's horrible. And um, we decided to find a better way, not just to bitch about it, but to go out and do something about it. And that's when we started traveling around the world and looking at different technologies and studying greenhouse production and looking at regenerative farming and looking at every farming technique that there was and trying to figure out, we didn't want to run away from technology. We don't think technology is evil. We love all types of farming. We don't think there's one solution or one silver bullet, but we were honestly really kind of offended by the division within agriculture. Everybody is like walking around with a hammer. So every problem looks like a nail, whatever your technology is, you're the only one that has a perfect solution. And we think that's frankly foolish and naive. You know, organic farming started great trends. We needed to take it to the next level. We wanted to grow the next generation of organic products. We wanted to not pollute the earth, not spray things with pesticides and herbicides. We wanted to have local food systems to, um, to provide that food security for the communities and that quality. And we started looking for technology to help. And we, again, went to Japan, went to Holland, went all over the world. And initially, we we're going to build greenhouses all over the country. And we felt that, honestly, that's a fine strategy for the next couple of years, but it's not a strategy I'll invest my own money in, you know, for five or 10 years from now. So we started looking for a better solution. We discovered indoor farming. And when we started this five, six years ago, whenever it was, you know, the technology wasn't there, frankly. Um, there were a lot of great pioneers doing wonderful things, but technology wasn't there. So we knew that we'd have to make investments. Another reason we didn't want to take outside money or initially, we didn't want to be pushed to go faster than we needed to and overspend. We wanted to develop this the right way, thoughtfully, methodically, very fast, 
but we needed to go at the right speed. We were moving very, very fast, but we didn't want to scale fast before we felt technology, data, everything else was ready. So there's a difference between how fast you innovate and how fast you scale. And we felt that taking early money would force us to scale faster than technology warranted. So we invested our own money. And significant money, by the way. We've had some very successful previous jobs. So uh, we were able to fortunately play not at a hobby level, but bring a team with us and real professionals, technology professionals, engineering professionals, horticulture professionals. And we realized that we could never do this ourselves. So we realized that there's so much to do here. This is so complex from, you know, we talk about AI, we talk about uh, horticulture, we talk about engineering, we talk about automation, we talk about food safety, we talk about running a business, fundraising. There's a million aspects to get right. So we decided that we met so many wonderful people and companies around the world that we wanted to partner with them. And we thought that the real way to get this to market was we created this company called Infinite Acres that my business partner, uh, Tisha Livingston, is the CEO of, and she runs that company now that builds this technology. And our partners, Priva and Akato, Priva has tremendous agricultural experience, I think 60 years of uh, building greenhouses and horticulture and agriculture. And Akato is a phenomenal technology company with supreme um, uh, predictive analytics and robotics and other things. We partner with them. We've partnered with a lot of seed breeders and um, a variety of other folks uh, to really try to bring this technology to life, allow other regions and other folks to buy that technology. And then 80 Acres can come in and help operate that for them. So we have our own farms that we build that we operate. But Infinite Acres will also sell a lot of this technology to others that, um, that want to go um, build these farms everywhere. We, we knew that, look, we can't do all this ourselves. We can't feed the whole world ourselves. We can't expand fast enough. And once we really figure something out, it's foolish and selfish to try to just keep it to ourselves. So why not share it? And we'll teach folks how to do it. And uh, there's so much white space here. The only thing I can promise you is, we're not going back to the 40s and 50s and 20s, and, and we're not going to rewind the clock back, but it doesn't mean we can't start having incredibly high quality food. And the world is changing. COVID is forcing this change. And um, you know, we just hope to play a little role in it. Mike, I appreciate you sharing that story. And I've got a couple of follow-up questions from there. Are you familiar with the book, The Fish That Ate the Whale? I'm not. You're a... Uh... You're throwing a lot of good things at me. Tell me about it. It's a, it's a really interesting story about a gentleman named Samuel Zamuri who immigrated to America, I think from Eastern Europe in the late 1800s. But he founded, I think it's the Standard Fruit Company. And he started it by buying almost similar produce to the one you mentioned in your, in your story there. They would, he would go to the market and he would buy what they call the bananas. I guess they call them ripes that were going to be, you know, going bad essentially in a day or two. And that's how he started Standard Fruit. Hmm. I'll look that up as well. That's great. Thank it, you. It's a, it's, it's a phenomenal story. And something else you mentioned there, which I would really like to learn more about, you mentioned how the current fruits and vegetables are bred for transportation. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great books uh, written about um, our food system, you know, books like Tomato Land, for example, um, and um, I can get you a bunch of names about the tomato industry, for example, in Florida. If you think about, you know, how you grow a tomato, again, most tomatoes for east of Mississippi come from Florida and west of Mississippi come from California. Well, these tomatoes, for example, have to travel that 2,000 miles to get from the farms to the stores and to the fields. And if you've ever, you know, a lot of tomatoes, I used to work for Conagra Foods and we, you know, had a lot of fields and bought a lot of tomatoes that we ended up canning uh, under the Hunt name. But if you follow a truck in Kern County and you follow these tomatoes, these tomatoes in a truck are green. The way you pick a tomato normally is you want it to see turn a little orange on the bottom. That's how you know that it's starting to ripen. 
and then you want to pick it right away so that it's still hard and can handle the transportation cycle. So first you start when you're breeding um, fruits and vegetables, you breed things for certain characteristics. You're breeding fruits and vegetables to be able to handle the pest pressure, for example, wherever you are growing things. You breed them to be able to uh, have the yields that the farmers need to be able to sell them and still be able to pay off their equipment and survive. You, you breed produce to have specific characteristics. You're breeding out certain characteristics and you're breeding in certain characteristics. And breeding cycles are very, very long cycles. I mean, CRISPR and a lot of other technology is going to be helping, but it, they're still very long cycles and there's a lot of um, science and time required there. Um, we're, we're breeding crops that need to be able to grow successfully in whatever environment they're growing and then get to market. And because our farms are moving further and further away from the markets, because land is expensive, it's polluted, and there's just not enough of it, um, the farms are very far away from population centers from where people are eating it. And when you think about these long, complex supply chains, there's a lot of touch points. It goes, you know, you grow fruit, you know, again, a lot of tomatoes will be grown in Mexico. They'll be picked before they're ripe. They'll be shipped to some sort of a... Um, um, a distribution facility that will aggregate things, pull them together, create customer orders. It'll go through a few more hands. It'll eventually get to the distribution center of a customer, um, like a retailer or a food service distributor. Then it has to go from that to a lot of times the regional distribution centers or the final stores. Then it goes in the back room of the stores. Then it comes out of that back room of the store to the finally to the shelf where you get to see it for the first time, but you're not seeing one-day-old produce. You're seeing 13, 14, 15-day-old produce. That produce might have 17 or 18 days shelf life to begin with. But by the time you see it there, it's already been through so much to be packed, handled, repacked, guessed with ethylene to get it to the right color. Um, whatever else happens to it depends on the product you're using. That by the time you get it, it's, uh, it's already been so abused. Um, that then you have to put it in the trunk of your car, take it home, you're breaking a cold chain, all these temperature differences, you bring it home, and now you got a couple of days to eat it before you throw it away. So if you want the products to make it through that mess, that complication, you have to start breeding for it. Otherwise, it just won't make it. You pick a ripe strawberry or ripe tomato and ship it 2,000 miles, you're going to get mush on the other side. So... That's the problem with these global supply chains. That's why, again, the idea is that if we can start growing locally, not only can we really start breeding produce, again, for flavor and nutrition and all of these great characteristics, but think about, again, plastics. You didn't have a plastic problem 50 years ago. You do have a plastic problem today. Why? because of our supply chains, because we're shipping things all over the place. There's a reason for plastics, by the way, it's better than throwing away food. But the point is we, we are having a massive issue now because we ship everything all over the place. And for some things it makes sense. You need your centers of excellence. You have your low cost production facilities or technologically advanced centers where you got to build certain things. That's great. But for food, you don't need to do that. Technology enables us today and it definitely will in three, five, ten years. What we're talking about now is going to be so ubiquitous again that um, you know people will have no idea how they ever lived without it. We will look back at you know the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s uh, with with shock in ten years, thinking, "Oh my God, we really lived like that. We really ate like that." We we won't believe it. It's like trying to imagine living without a cell phone right now. Um, it'll be that ubiquitous. So local food productions are critical. It allows us to not have to protect the product, ship it all over the place. That's how we really solve a lot of our plastic issues and packaging issues and all these other things. Um, it's, it's all interwined, right? There's not, on one hand, there's no one silver bullet that'll solve all your problems. On the other hand, we create these complex systems and then we fix one problem by creating three other problems. And then we fix one of those three problems, create three more problems. And we weave this really complex web that we can't unweave. And everybody keeps coming up with a new app and a new tech to try to improve it. And the answer with the food system is stop. 
you know, we're not going back to 50 years ago, but we're going to use technology to completely unwind and redo because we can do so much better than what we have been doing more effectively, right price, uh, much higher quality. Thank you for the education on that. And I will definitely look at that book. You said it's called The Tomato? Tomato Land. Yeah, Tomato Land. Is Tomato a, Land. A great book. Yeah, from a couple. And earlier you mentioned your partner in Infinite Farms. And I'm bringing this up because I think it's really relevant right now. I had a conversation last week with some people involved in commercial real estate. And they were speaking about all the additional retail real estate and you know office building real estate that's going to be potentially up on the market after the pand- pandemic. And so am I understanding correctly that you have a, and I'm going to use these words, franchise model? We do, right. So yeah, we can sell modular farms through a company called Infinite Acres, and it's uh, infiniteacres, I believe, dot com. Um, but I'll provide, um, if, if you Google Infinite Acres, it'll come up, and I think we have links to it on our website as well. And Infinite Acres will absolutely sell farms to folks. And if you have, you know, people that might not want to operate a farm, uh, but they want to buy a farm, that's fine. Again, there's more to it than just building a farm, right? I mean, you got to create a business, and that's where the complexity comes in. You got to you need technology to make it work. Then people get so enamored with technology, they forget that it's still farming, and farming is still challenging work, and it requires a lot. So we are happy to provide a team to operate that farm wherever that is in the world. Um, we've been working. We have a lot of growers. We have, for example, only seven farms are now building an eighth large farm, and we have uh, 20 growers. Uh, so we've been training these growers. We have grower training programs to go operate these farms for other people um, all over the place. And um, But yeah, we will absolutely, uh, through Infinite Acres, uh, enable folks to buy a farm. We can help them operate it. Again, you know, you got to be able to sell the produce. You got to have retail relationships. But a lot of customers are retailers that you know um, have space that needs to be better utilized. So the issue you're raising is a very real issue, and um, and I think there'll be a lot of opportunities there to reutilize some 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 assets that are, have been retired but are not done yet. So I will I will find the link and put a link in the show notes to Infinite Acres, and I appreciate that. So you've learned a lot on this journey. What are some of the aha moments or surprise moments that you've had? Yeah, lots. Uh, where to begin? I think the first one that I love to use is, again, this the fact that, you know, um, our 25-year-old farmer that I mentioned earlier might actually have more practical experience than somebody who's been farming for 30, 40 years because we'll go through more cycles and we'll have much more control over environments instead of just randomly reacting to whatever nature throws you and just building up a gut. It's, it's a blend of, of science and, um, and, um, and experience. Um, look, it's, it's tough to, uh, to start a business. It's not my first one, but it's, it's a challenge. There's been a lot of lessons on having, the right team with you, the right partners, the realization that I think if you're really trying to change an industry, there's no one silver bullet. There's no one thing that'll do it. It'll take so many different things, so many different disciplines, so many different companies, so many different partners. You know, the old saying, it takes a village, couldn't be more true if you're really trying to solve a complex uh, global business problem. And I think we've been really fortunate and um, you can say lucky, you can say blessed, you can say whatever your belief system is, apply um, um, an adjective to describe it. Uh, but um, very fortunate to um, have the community support everywhere we operate, to have the partners that we do across the food spectrums from retailers and food service providers and local farmers we work with. Um, and investors and, um, and technology partners, and I can just keep going and going. And, and I think about when you start this journey, it's, it's always one of those things that I, I had a boss a long time ago um, who was a PhD in chemical engineering. I'm, going, I'm rewinding back about 25, 26 years ago, and I remember him telling me that 
had I known what it would take, I would have never done it. It's kind of the same thing um, with uh, starting a business. If I think it's good to be a bit naive, no matter how much experience you think you have. But if when you start something this uh, magnificent and hopefully this world changing, if you really have a, the, an iota of understanding of what it'll take to actually get it from, not from A to B, but from A to, to J or A to K, um, you, you'd think a lot harder about doing it. And it's, again, it's a, it's a labor of love. I can't imagine doing anything else. I can't imagine uh, working with a more dedicated, more caring, more thoughtful and um, uh, inspiring group of people. Um, yeah, just every part of the journey has been a lesson. The beauty of what we do is you really learn every day and every week. And if you don't, you know, this is wrong business because we are discovering America every week uh, here. It's um, the, the rate of change and the rate of learning is phenomenal. And that's the thing that keeps us all waking up and rushing to get to work. I love that idea of discovering America every week and teeing off on that. The last question I have for you is that if you could share some advice or words of wisdom with the audience, what would it be? I don't know. Um, again, so many things come to mind. I'd say be your authentic self and just don't be afraid. Be bold and focus on your core. Focus on your core values and your core skills. Don't try to impress anybody else and do what others expect. Just go do what you're great at and just be great at your own thing. And, and there are no books written for what successful entrepreneurs do because we're writing a book. We're writing a book every day as we're making decisions and screwing things up and fixing other things. So um, no fear, be bold and fail fast, cheap and with tremendous insight. And our corporate values, I'm kind of going through our corporate values, own it. Every company, you know, every, everybody in our company is an owner or if they're not yet, they will be. Um, if they're contributing, if they're adding value and you know, you dream it and you make it real. I mean, just don't let anything stop you. Be pragmatic, um, be thoughtful and ethical, but um, yeah, just just own it, own it, and don't be afraid. Um, but then you can't you can't stop when it gets tough, right? You just got to keep fighting through it and keep gritting through it and and keep finding a way. You you can never have doubt that whatever you're doing will be successful because life throws so many obstacles at you. You can never have doubt. The question is how you deal with them and. Hopefully you have a support structure to get you through it. Thank you for that, Mike. And I've so enjoyed speaking to you and pun intended. I'm looking forward to watching your company grow. <laughs> Is there anything that we have not spoken about that you'd like to talk about or share before we go? No, I think this was a lot of fun. I appreciate your time. Mike, thank you so much. And I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank you, Raj. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening. And if you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And if you want to show your support, please share our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. Bigger Than Us is a Nexus PMG production.